Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the March RDLA webinar. I'm going to give everyone just a few seconds to get logged on, and then we will get into all of the good things. Caitlin, I hate to interrupt. Um, I don't think I can enter in the chat for everyone. Okay, let me edit that real quick while we wait. Okay, there you go. You should be good to go now. Awesome. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, again, thank you guys all for being here for the March RDLA webinar. Um, we have some really awesome speakers for you guys. So thank you for taking the time to join us. If you prefer to call into today's webinar, you can do so using the phone number and webinar ID on the screen here. Um, as we're going through the presentation, uh, each person's presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of the speakers. Um, if you would like to do that, just click on the Q&A um, function on your screen and enter your question, and we will get uh, the questions directed to the speakers. And just a reminder, if we do have any media joining us, uh, we ask that you formally announce your participation and refrain from quoting any of uh, the panelists or discussion during today's webinar. Um, if you would like to quote anything, we encourage you to follow up with participants afterwards. We also have closed captioning available for this webinar. Um, you can just click the live transcript button at the bottom of your window. And we also have Spanish translation services available. Um, Shannon has dropped a link in the chat for you guys. So if you are interested in using the Spanish translation services, you can just click on that link and it will pull up for you. So this is today's uh, webinar lineup. So we are going to be talking about federal appropriations and uh, what these lovely organizations are focusing on in terms of rare disease appropriation priorities for this year. Uh, so we are first going to start out with Ryan Shea from Fagray Drinker Consulting. And Ryan is going to give you guys a uh, breakdown into the federal appropriations process before we get into the specific appropriations priorities. Uh, and then Steve Grossman from the Alliance for a Stronger FDA. Jay Nichols uh, from March of Dimes, Dylan Simon from the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, and John Retzlaff from the American Association for Cancer Research are all here uh, to share their organization's rare disease appropriation priorities for the year. So, Ryan, I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Caitlin. I look way better in that picture. <laughs> well, it's great to great to join all of you. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about appropriations. I, I think it's the, the coolest and most interesting part of, of your government that you likely didn't learn in civics class or in high school government. And but it, it, in large part, it's the actual meat and potatoes of how the government spends its money and the priorities as it has. Just very quick background. I was an appropriator legislative director in the House, worked both in the Senate as well. And so this is my Bread and butter and excited to talk with you about it, give an overview of the process and obviously our additional panelists can provide additional detail, but want to give you a sense of, of how appropriations fits into the broader congressional context and then also just the calendar and, and way to think about appropriations from a 12 month perspective. So Caitlin, let's, let's move on. So just, just really quick here, a uh, number of you, of course, if you're familiar with this world, the difference between authorizations and appropriations to kind of give a sense of what in the world we're talking about. Authorization is largely policy related provisions. And so a program should do X, Y, and Z, or a benefit should be ABC. Appropriations is the actual money going to individual programs and accounts uh, in the federal government. And so we'll talk about the different types of appropriations bills, the committees that have jurisdiction over there, and then the process of appropriations itself, and then time, have time for a little bit of a discussion. So again, as I mentioned before, authorization versus appropriations, this is a way to see when you're looking at a particular bill, understanding whether it is an authorizing or an appropriating bill. You can see we have authorizing on the left and appropriations on, on the right. And the thing to, I guess, to, to note especially is that the, the power of appropriations is specifically called out in the Constitution and the Article I powers of Congress. And so, and, the, and you can see that in the highlighted provision there from section nine. And so it's an integral part of what Congress does is determine how federal tax dollars, the actual money from the federal government is spent. Next slide, please. 
And as I mentioned, there's a number of different types of appropriations bills and appropriations methods. So this is where for all of you as advocates or those that are interested in this space can be taking some notes and be thinking about for your priorities and for the folks that are gonna be following after me, how do you execute your advocacy goals in the appropriations space? So the first type is, is what's called a regular appropriations bill. Typically they, they involve an omnibus bill. So the end of the year Christmas tree bill is it's sometimes referred to as the big funding bill to essentially pay for that at that next fiscal year. And so typically that has a, either has to be passed at the end of the fiscal year, uh, which of course at the end of September, or which typically happens if can is kicked down the road a couple months and the final omnibus bill is passed in, in December. Continuing resolution is one of those bills that allows you to kick that can down the road. It essentially is a stopgap funding where it provides the appropriated dollars for the previous fiscal year for a set period of time. And then the supplemental appropriations bills, we've seen a number of those recently. Examples of those can include like supplemental funding for uh, the fighters in Ukraine or response to disaster relief from a hurricane or a flood or something like that. Those are the three types of bills themselves, but in the actual methods, the actual provisions, are, there's three. Typically the most common is, is programmatic funding. That's the amount of money that, that the uh, respective department can spend on a particular program. And so, you know, Congress will appropriate $10 million for a program to help, uh, I don't know, those struggling with housing insecurity. That's an appropriating programmatic provision. Or important language going with this example would be in executing that programmatic goal, the agency needs to do X, Y, and Z. So a report language could be uh, the committee is concerned about the Department of Health and Human Services inattentiveness to veterans that are struggling with housing insecurity. That would be an example of report language. It's a way to steer the, and, and have parameters perhaps and in, in other values and how the money is actually implemented and executed on behalf of the tax dollars, but by the executive branch. And then the third is community project funding or congressionally directed spending in the Senate, uh, broadly known colloquially as, as earmarks. That's congressionally directed spending money appropriated for a specific constituent-based project, whether that's money to help rebuild a school, uh, to provide technology in a hospital setting, uh, and those were, were not available for over 10 years but have since come back last year was the first year of using earmarks in over a decade and this year, uh, we're doing them again. So uh, next slide, please. And then what should, uh, should be a little apparent here, but the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee are the committees that have jurisdiction over the actual spending of money. And typically these, these members are, are generally not firebrands. They're generally uh, pretty consensus, pretty middle of the road and are willing to work together because the steering committee determines who gets on, on what committees. And so the appropriations committee tends to be pretty serious members and carry a lot of weight uh, as to the, the bills that are actually done by their committees that determine funding levels. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So there's 12 subcommittees. And so by extension, there's 12 appropriations bills that Congress has to pass every year or those different departments shut down. Uh, that's it's as simple as that and so each of these uh, subcommittees are responsible for crafting a bill every year and different committees do it differently some of them do a full market process they'll pass a bill to go to the floor others write a bill and then it gets thrown into that end of year omnibus that we were talking about with a couple days to look at and there are different political reasons and calculations for why certain bills would take more time on the floor, no time on the floor. Uh, that just depends on the on the political context that the majority for either chamber is dealing with. And so for a lot of our purposes here, health and human services, educational agencies, LAHSE is oftentimes how it's referred to is where a lot of the federal programs uh, for health programs are, are included, obviously. Next slide, please. So then I'm just going to breeze through the calendar here and then get over to our other panelists as well. But I think it's helpful to take this out of the abstract. You know, what are these types of funding bills? What are the types of methods? And then think through what does it actually look like year to year in the calendar perspective? And so uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about here is the president's budget. And the, the president's budget is largely a statement of the administration's funding values and policy priorities. But as a force of law, it has none. Congress is, is responsible for drafting and funding the government and deciding those appropriations funding levels. But the budget does provide a guide as to if, if the political context on the Hill, right? If the president's party controls both chambers on the Hill, the budget may contour into the final appropriations bill or it might contrast it 
uh, pretty differently if it's a, a divided government, either in the chambers or in the White House. Next slide, please. Oh, and uh, here's just an example of the president's budget for uh, fiscal year 23. It's helpful to understand where their priorities are, but you shouldn't conclude, though, that if, there, if the budget requests next amount of money for a program, that that's necessarily going to be appropriated by Congress. It just doesn't work that way. It, it often indicates the administration's priority, but it's ultimately up to Congress to determine that. And I guess a great example would be during the Trump administration, their budget you know, continually had different cuts to different health programs. It was not particularly planned of, of, of health research, but Congress essentially said, we're not going to listen to that. We're going to continue to appropriate funds for these departments. And even examples like NIH, they saw massive increases under the Trump administration. So again, underscoring the, I guess the broader point is that Congress is, is in very much in charge, only in charge in the funding and determining the differences in those funding levels uh, for the federal government. Next slide, please. So the first thing we do procedurally in Congress when we're setting up the appropriations process is we have to agree to a budget resolution. And that's next slide. It's basically the instructions for determining what's possible in the appropriations space. And so uh, each, each of the House committees have to uh, come up with, well, the appropriations committee comes with the essentially what's called the, like the baseline or the amount of money that they're going to consider appropriating. And then if you use uh, this resolution also for reconciliation, that's what the second picture is. Each of the committees are then charged with setting up savings that can then be used to appropriate money through a reconciliation bill. That's a supplemental appropriations bill, a third type that we mentioned there. And this is an example here of that con you know, concurrent resolution or that CR that they set up to in order to begin the appropriations process. Next slide. And then that's what happens in April. So March and April, you typically have the budget resolution. In April, you do the individual member deadlines. Next slide, we'll give an example for that. So as outside advocates and non-members of Congress, you can make a request to a member. You can't, you can't directly yourself make the submission to the committee. The committee submissions are done by members. And so typically members that are on those committee have more weight for certain priorities, but off committee members. And so for all those members, you know, you know, 300 and change or so in the House and then, you know, well over half the Senate that aren't on a committee. It's, it's their prerogative to highlight their priorities for the committee. And so here's an example from Congresswoman Del Bene on she set an internal deadline uh, last year for April 13th for 2022. Now, what she did then is then all of the requests come in and the staff review them, and then they decide what they want to submit to committee as their priorities. And that is a real indicator of what that member ultimately really cares about in the appropriation space. What are they willing to put their name on? And so this is the chance where anyone can make a programmatic funding request, a report language request, or community project funding if you comply with the, the new rules on that process. And so that's your first step. That's right. You, you make a request to a member of Congress and say, hey, I would really appreciate it if you included our priority in your formal requests. Next slide. And then there's the actual subcommittee deadlines of the, of the committees themselves. Remember those 12 subcommittees that we talked about. So the member deadline always precedes the subcommittee deadline because they need time to review and figure out what their priorities are going to be and then submit them to the subcommittee. Next slide, please. And here's an example of like what submission instructions can look like for members. And so you have internal deadlines there that they all need to meet. And so that's always a, a flurry of activity. So the advice always generally is getting into the members that you're submitting to as early as possible because the amount of requests are just overwhelming. And so trying to establish that relationship, but then also get it done ahead of time is really helpful. Next slide, please. And then in June and July, this is what I remember really well as an appropriator LD and then for former staff on the call, I remember too, this is where the, where the House tends to mark up, which is to make changes, amend, and then pass their various appropriations bills. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, Congress has to pass 12 in order for all the different departments to get their funding, but not all get markups necessarily, and not all are considered on the floor. And so here's an example of a couple of years ago. This is the one I was at when we were marking up the labor HHSC bill. And then you can see on the right, there's a, a, a package of seven subcommittee bills that were passed at the same time. Uh, that's done for a variety of political reasons, obviously, but that's, that's the procedure in June and July this tends to happen. And then on the next slide, you'll see that the Senate does this a little bit differently. Um, and and uh, you can go to the next slide, please. 
The Senate tends to do this later in the year, and they tend to do it over August and October. Next slide, please. And it's up in the air to the degree in which that they have full markups and will pass bills on the floor. Uh, as you'll notice, last year and for previous years, a lot of the ultimate funding bills were written primarily by the Senate. And so you can't take the lack of formal markups or proceedings as disengagement, and rather they're doing a lot of deal making and consensus building behind the scenes that is then unveiled oftentimes in that end of year omnibus bill. But this is just an example of when you can watch a Senate markup bill for a labor HSE. Uh, next slide, please. And then October 1, as we mentioned, that's where you get the expiration of funding for that previous fiscal year. And so next slide, please. Uh, unless Congress appropriates that continued resolution or an omnibus, the government does shut down. And so typically, that is the ch first choke point in this process to ensuring that the appropriation priorities that Congress has is actually enacted into law. And so, as I mentioned before, we talked about the continuing resolution. That's often that stopgap appropriations bill that allows Congress time in order to negotiate a final end of year bill. Next slide, please. And then in October through December, that's where the omnibus negotiations are taking place. Typically, like December 15th, December 16th is pretty traditional for continuing resolutions or CRs. And then the hopeful idea in the next slide, please, is that in December, that's where Congress finally agrees to the appropriations bill, the omnibus bill. Typically, they're called the Consolidated Appropriations Act for that particular fiscal year. So this is an, ex is an example of what that bill looked like. And you can look it up on congress.gov right now. And then the actual enacted text for itself. And so in that bill, they funded all 12 uh, you know, subcommittee bills and then all the different federal agencies that rely on federal dollars. And so that's the process. And then on the next slide, you see is that next year we get to do this all over again. And so we do this in December. And then before you know it, in February, the president's budget is out and then we're off to the races again. Uh, I know I've been going for a really long time, but uh, Caitlin, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are, and then happy to turn it over to our other panelists. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was great. Um, let me check and see if there are any questions for you. Right now, there are not, but there I'll may think be that some. That is a win. <laughs> that means you did a great job. <laughs> um, oh, a question was just submitted. Ryan, uh, will we have regular order this year? I think regular order is a spectrum, right? Like regular order is. It, I don't think it's an either or. So there's some things will be regular order, right? So the House will consider some bills in markup. Uh, the House will probably pass some bills. The Senate will probably not, as we talked about. But does that negate that the regular order is ultimately taking place in that Congress is appropriating dollars through an omnibus bill, right? So. Regular order is a spectrum. You can have some regular order, some not regular order. And it's also in the, the eye of the beholder, right? Like, you know, it, there's a question of process versus outcome. And typically majorities that are new uh, often are very focused on procedural regular order, but often dial it back when they realize the challenges that that provides either politically or procedurally and then opt to, a, I would generally call a hybrid strategy of regular order versus outcomes focused order. And so that's where I think what's always interesting is when you have divided government, like we have now, of course, regular order on, on paper sounds more likely, but in practicality, I, I would say it's, it's more of a spectrum and there are more much more fits and starts when it's divided government versus unified government. Um, and even, Last Congress, I would say uh, the Democrat majority was pretty regular order in the House, not so much in the Senate if from this very strict interpretation. But at the same time, the, the outcome was always positive from their perspective, right? The government was always funded. It was funded at levels that were, you know, in line with their priorities. And so that's what I would always ask the regular order discussion is its procedures but also what are you getting in the outcome uh, is something else to think about. Hope that's helpful. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, and people may continue to drop questions in the chat or Q&A for you. So be sure to keep an eye out for those. Yeah, of course. And I'm sure Caitlin has contact information, but if any of you have specific questions or like to chat further, this is something that, as you can see, that I love and uh, I'd be happy to engage you know, further in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Perfect, guys. Well, I am going to turn things over to Stephen Grossman. He is joining us from the Alliance for a Stronger FDA. Uh, so Stephen, I will turn things over to you. Okay, very good. And let me just add. There we go. Now I feel at home. So thank you. Um, that was a great introduction. Can I get you to open for me every time? Because it would be <laughs> it, it would be fabulous because I suspect that a lot of my audiences think I start in the middle. And it would be great if, if I could somehow find a way to encapsulate that and have all my audiences know what this audience now knows. Um, I'd also, before I start talking about FDA, I'd like to just uh, jump in on this issue of regular order. Regular order was conceived in the Budget Control and Empowerment Act of the 1970s, that was passed in the 1970s. It is an image of what in a ideal world, with a Congress that was efficient and left personalities at the door, could and should happen every year in order to be regular. Um, the nature of the system we have made regular order not that common, even in early eras, and the increased politicization, the amount of time that it takes because the budget's gotten so much more complex than it used to be, um, it's a benchmark, and uh, anybody who's waiting for regular order to come about is going to be disappointed because I don't envision it ever coming back. So uh, less a matter of divided Congress and maybe more about a complex budget and a divided nation. So with that, let me let me introduce myself or the alliance. The alliance has existed for more than 15 years. We're a a coalition a, a, of about 150 organizations. We have consumer and patient group members. We have health professional societies. We have trade groups and we have companies. And we have two goals. One is to advocate for increased resources uh, for the FDA, and that's a increased budget authority, that is taxpayer funding, um, a, about 40% of FDA is funded by user fees. But one of the things that we've learned is they don't actually really need an advocacy force the way the budget authority does, because it's only, it's not competing. Uh, in with the BA numbers, which is what most everybody will be talking about throughout this panel, we're competing with uh, a number of other programs. I should mention that we're in the agriculture subcommittee of appropriations so that that's different. Um, we've been well treated over there, but it is different than lobbying, labor and HHS uh, appropriations where the orientations and the interests are quite a bit different. So in the process of our years, where the other thing we do is we educate about FDA's mission and responsibilities uh, because the best argument for robust funding and for a growing funding source for the FDA relates exactly to how much it does and how broad it is. The example I usually use is the Social Security Administration. The Social Security Administration is vastly bigger than FDA, uh, has huge amounts of money, et cetera, et cetera. But when you break it down, SSA only does about five, six, seven different things, and they do them millions of times. 
FDA is just the opposite. I could start now listing all the things that FDA does and I wouldn't be done in two hours with all the different things. And so it's a very different need and it's very dynamic because FDA is 100% of drugs, biologics and devices and 70 plus about 78% of the food supply. And that's before we get to cosmetics and dietary supplements and veterinary medicines, et cetera. So anyway, we've been, we've been very successful in large part because the appropriations committees have listened to us. When we started, FDA was getting about $1.6 billion in budget authority, that is taxpayer funding. And in FY23, uh, we were at $3.5 billion. And now I get to the actual what's happening now. On that base of $3.5 billion, the administration has proposed an increase of $372 million, which would be about a 10% increase. Uh, it's spread across all those different functions. As I said, there are literally hundreds of them. Uh, the Let's make sure I got my books here. So what, what's important for the rare disease community, since that's what this is really about? Um, the, uh, there are a couple of initiatives. Most of the rare disease work from a regulatory standpoint occurs in, um, in CBER and CEDAR. And so one of the things that's driving new activity in this, year, in this past year and this coming year, in the current year rather, and then the fiscal year we're talking about that starts in October, is that we just finished the end of the five-year user fee cycle, and there are new agreements in place as to what will be accomplished. That has led to, for instance, CEDAR will have about $200 million more in FY24 than it did in FY22 as a result of the user fee agreements. So there's money to do a lot of things at, at CEDAR, and that's important. Um, in terms of the appropriations, in continued growth is needed and user fees only pay for very specific activities so that you can never do the work that's needed if you only had user fees. So with that in mind, what is in the president's request that should be of particular interest to the rare disease community? And I picked up on two that I think are a primary interest. One of them is the president's commitment to reigniting the cancer moonshot. And currently, according to the budget documents, FDA puts about $2 million a year into the cancer moonshot. And the proposal in the president's request is to bump that up to $50 million. So basically the opportunity to have 25 fold more money to work with. Now, as probably most of you know, uh, we tend to think of cancers as a society in terms of the large ones, but all but about four cancers are rare diseases. And so any time that cancer programs get more money, uh, rare diseases will absolutely benefit from that. So that's a, a highlight of the president's request. The other is that uh, there's new monies, additional monies for the ACT for ALS program, uh, which is pushing FDA to do additional work in neurodegenerative de diseases. Uh, as somebody who's done FDA regulatory work for a very long time, neurodegenerative diseases are uh, an area that's very hard in terms of endpoints. It's very hard in terms of, of proving safety and efficacy. And it's an area that has not advanced uh, as well as many other therapeutic and clinical areas. Uh, so this is, according to the documents, FDA is now uh, spending $5 million on neurodegenerative diseases and ALS. And there's a proposal to create, can increase that by about 50% by another $2.5 million. I would say the money is important. I don't want to diminish that, but in a budget document that runs 300 pages in which the administration 
has focused its money requests on about 12 different items, not more, that one of them is Act for ALS is important symbolically, as well as the benefit that the money uh, will pay for. It's certainly a message to people in the uh, Neurology Center and others at FDA that neurodegenerative diseases need to be an important focus of the agency. Finally, uh, there is a large percentage of the 372 million, about $100 million is to pay for pay increases that have not been otherwise funded. That may seem very not policy, et cetera, et cetera, but part of, of what, makes, what makes rare disease work at FDA work succeed is the quality of the staff and their ability to recruit individuals who are intellectually interested as well as talented in areas that are needed. And so paying for the pay raise is very indirect, but it is a boost for rare disease disease work at FDA. That's that's what there is to tell. I'd be happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, I'm taking a look at the Q and A box and the chat here, and I'm not seeing any questions just yet. Um, but be sure to keep an eye out. I'm sure that people will put some in there for you as we go. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Jay Nichols, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Uh, everyone, Jay is joining us from the March of Dimes uh, to share a bit more with us about their appropriations in terms of uh, the rare disease community. Thank you, Kaylin. And hello, everybody. It's great to be with all of you. Um, really appreciate uh, not only speaking with you, but I also have the privilege of uh, working with many of you as well on our in uh, advancing our uh, maternal and infant health agenda on Capitol Hill. Um, again, I'm with the March of Dimes. Uh, we actually are having our fly in next to the middle of next week. So we've uh, given, been preparing for that. Um, but we are just you know, before I jump into um, our priorities for fiscal year 24. Uh, March of Dimes, we are the leading nonprofit uh, organization fighting for the health of all moms and babies. Um, we are now in our 85th year uh, here in 2023. Uh, originally, we were uh, founded um, under Roosevelt uh, to cure polio, and uh, it eventually over the decades expanded much more into the maternal uh, health space, especially for um, on behalf of uh, underserved communities. And um, um, our uh, portfolio, as I mentioned, is most is maternal and infant health, but certainly with can, uh, regard to rare diseases, um, it's definitely priority number one, when, especially when it comes to working on appropriations. Um, I know one of my colleagues in particular who will be speaking shortly after I do, we collaborate very, very closely in particular on newborn screening uh, initiatives. Um, and so um, that's that's what we do. We have what's called our March for Change initiative. That's not only part of next week here in DC, but also all around the country. Um, we have um, you know very various high profile um, um or meetings and uh, and uh, convenings and uh, um, with, of course, um, the rare disease issue always at the forefront. So um, I think it's a good segue if I can go to the next slide. So um, just some very, very brief uh, background. Um, you know, the United States, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately remains a very, very dangerous place for a developed nation for childbirth. Um, as you'll see with the statistics uh, below, on average, near, nearly two women will die from pregnancy on a daily basis. Um, two babies die in the United States uh, almost every hour. Um, you know, over um, the past 30 years, uh, pregnancy-related deaths have more than doubled. Um, you know, and, you know, COVID certainly has contributed to, to that as well over the last couple of years. Um, we also have found that uh, over 2 million women live in what are known as maternity care deserts that offer very, very little met, uh, services related uh, to birthing needs. Um, in fact, we just published a report uh, late last year. We all encourage you to uh, visit uh, on our website. And then... Seven, 7 million women overall um, live in counties without access or very limited access to maternity care. So uh, the 
we I, we are very much living through a um, a uh, major maternal health crisis, and that is obviously what drives uh, our um, our work towards uh, our agenda, especially for this year with Congress. And I think we go to the next slide. And that is our mission, uh, healthy moms and strong babies, and, and in particular, trying to close the uh, health equity gap. Um, and uh, I think we, we can go ahead and move forward. <clears throat> and so that's what brings us to our appropriations, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our appropriations agenda. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right at the very front of uh, uh, is with regards to newborn screening. I think everyone here on this call is very familiar with the federal newborn screening programs and how successful they have been, if not probably the most successful public health program we've had over the last couple of decades. Um, you know, it, it, it uh, saves the lives of more than 12,000 inf infants uh, each year. Um, I, along with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, we are the co-leads of a newborn screening coalition um, that, uh, you know, is uh, seeks to increases in funding uh, for uh, all federal programs on a yearly basis. Uh, in particular, there are two. One is called the Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program at the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, and the other known as the um, Heritable um, Disorders Program, which is housed under the Health Resources Services Administration. Um, the Quality Assurance Program, uh, you know, provides the resources and uh, needs um, is in working very, very closely uh, in, with regards to testing needs for more than 500 laboratories to help ensure the accuracy of screening tests. Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, which meets quarterly, uh, and it also provides uh, recommendations uh, to the H, uh, to Secretary of Health and Human Services um, for uh, what's known as uh, adding conditions to the recommended uniform screening panel. I want to pause for one moment because I just had a note saying my internet connection was unstable, and I just want to make sure I didn't freeze up. You did for just a second, Jay. Did did I did I miss on something key or did 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 you kind of I just want to make sure that everybody heard. Um, I guess in short, what we are doing is with regards to newborn screening for this year is we are actually pursuing uh, the same funding requests that um, that the uh, coalition pushed for last year, which is uh, for the quality assurance program. We were requesting uh, twenty nine million dollars and uh for the heritable disorders program roughly the same 29 million um you know to support the need to help support both those programs we're also urging congress to support additional uh dollars towards um supporting full implementation of the rusp in all 50 states um and uh you know the, the these resources will help allow for a timely implementation of all newborn screening commission uh conditions uh hopefully by, uh, by 2025. um so that is really what with regards to rare diseases that is our priority number one it always has been um over the last few years i really think that with many of you who are joined on this call i know we collaborate with all of you and i think thanks to your advocacy and, and your support for our work as well as uh, the work of uh, our coalition uh, we've been able to get increases on an annual basis but uh, there's a long way to go but we think that um you know we think that uh, we are we are well positioned uh, it's very very strongly uh, supported in a bipartisan fashion and um and we we think we can continue to move forward uh to to get these critical resources um and i lumped in the um in, in, as you'll see in our slide we also um as part of our full portfolio we also prioritize uh maternal depression um and maternal mental health conditions you know, in this country, roughly one in five uh, women are infected by anxiety and depression and under and other uh, maternal mental health conditions um, during pregnancy or the year following it. Um, it's most common. Uh, it is the uh, most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth uh, impacts roughly 800,000 women just here in the United States alone on an annual basis. Um, uh, sadly, these conditions usually go undiagnosed or untreated, and this can increase the risk of long-term negative um, uh, impacts on the health of the mother and the child and the family. Um, and so, and as you can imagine, it really, um, um, pardon me, it really, uh, women of color and women who live in poverty are the ones who are mostly disproportionately impacted by these conditions. Um, and so what we do, what we have here is there are two programs that were actually 
um, officially authorized in the fiscal year 23 omnibus appropriations bill. One is the maternal mental health hotline. Um, it was originally created in fiscal year 21. Uh, what it does is it provides um, uh, counsel. It provides 24 hour counseling. Um, and to, to obviously with qualified counselors, it's a hotline and helps conduct you know, outreach on maternal mental health issues. Um, it provides, uh, you know, text messaging services and culturally appropriate support, as well as public awareness and other educational materials. Um, we are seeking, and this is what it's authorized at, uh, it was funded at $7 million for this year. We are requesting $10 million. Um, as I mentioned, that is actually the, uh, the authorizing level. And the other program is the, uh, what's called, it, it's a, um, a uh, grant program that uh, is you know designed to help combat you know uh, maternal mental health and substance uh, um, use disorders. Um, again, this was original. This was a program that was created via the appropriations process, but finally got its authorization in the omnibus bill of of last year. And this uh, provides direct assistance to states. And we are requesting a fourteen million dollar increase, up to just uh, up to twenty four million dollars, to have more states get involved and benefit uh, from the technical assistance. Um, from this particular grant program um and so i think we can go down to the the next slide thank you um and finally uh with uh on our priorities uh Again, with the maternal and infant health spe you know, full spectrum, we are very, very much uh, invested in research as well as um, access to uh, vaccines. Um, probably the, the uh, largest agency we are involved with um, is the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Uh, this is actually the agency where the Hunter Kelly Newborn Screening Program is housed, and so we obviously we, we support that. But this is also the agency that um, provides vital research on preterm birth, maternal mortality, uh, substance uh, abuse, um, you know, prenatal, uh, other prenatal issues. Um, and uh, we are, uh, you know, they, uh, we rely very, very heavily, at least in March of Dimes, on the research that they produce um, for our own, uh, for our reports. Um, and there's a particular study, uh, one study, I'm sorry, in particular, what uh, it's called the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. Um, is uh, it focuses on uh, key, uh, pediatric needs, um, and uh, it's roughly 180 million dollar a year program that we have been uh, supported over the, over the years. Um, and so for uh, the uh, institute for NICHD, we are seeking uh, uh, requesting uh, just under 1.9 billion. Um, that's about 130 30 or so million dollar increase over the current uh, uh, funding level. Um, the next. Uh, priority of ours is what's called the Surveillance for Emerging Threats to Mothers and Babies Initiatives, um, or SETNET. Uh, this was actually created during uh, the Zika outbreak in 2016. Um, and what it does is that it um, it was created for to provide kind of um, kind of in real time uh, clinical guidance, help educate healthcare providers and as well as communities and connect families to care, um, to help identify threats, as you can imagine, uh, by, you know, uh, that, that could impact both moms and babies. Um, it was funded at roughly $23 million for this year. We are seeking a uh, hundred million for next year and um, uh, basically to help expand uh, their capabilities to help gather the critical public health data infrastructure and surveillance systems needed that were established under SETNET and eventually try to get it. it it's much, uh, it's it's not nationwide yet, but we're hoping to actually scale it up uh, in, in the coming over the next few years. Um, and again, it's it's really with concentration, you know, help identify risks uh, for, for pregnancy risks and, um, um, and help, uh, you know, um, advance that program forward to um to a nation to a nationwide uh, service uh the safe motherhood initiative um what uh, here at um uh march of dimes what we are very much involved in are what are called maternal mortality review committees and perinatal quality collaboratives um, um maternal mortality review committees um they're established under the cdc they provide funding and technical assistance uh and help um you know, again, study uh, the impacts and causes of maternal deaths, as well as uh, promote prevention 
uh, opportunities. Um, this is again another program, uh, another uh, program where it's uh, roughly in about 25 states, um, but we need obviously need much more to, to to address the need, especially more investment to support data collection and ex to help examine all factors contributing to maternal mortality or preventable deaths or poor and poor birth outcomes. Um, and then perinatal quality collaboratives are, are again, another service under CDC, they're roughly in the same number of states, are serve as the um, kind of, uh, it, it provide implementation needs and recommendations for health, for health networks. Um, uh, however, currently in its current state, they lack the resources to meet the demands. Um, and so this is yet another uh, initiative that we are you know, hoping more funds can help scale up nationwide. We are requesting $164 uh, million, um, which would be about a 52, 53 or so increase from this current year. And um, the final priority that, <clears throat> that March of Dimes is pushing in FY24 is, of course, related to COVID, um, primarily the ending of the public health emergency in May. Um, the Section 317 uh, immunization program supports um, Primarily, uh, it supports vaccine access, especially for low-income communities. Um, and it's done through grants to states, um, and it, including um, for adults that have no other means to pay for them. Uh, the Vaccines for Children's program is also a part of Section 317. And it is, you know, with the public health emergency ending, um, uh, we must prepare for, obviously, uh, the next outbreak or pandemic. And we can probably, you know, um, expect that in the near future. However, because of COVID, there were a lot of families that missed routine vaccinations, and um, could, that could certainly, especially children, and that could compromise their health. And so, we are requesting just over a billion dollars to scale this program out to provide as much uh, needed assistance um, in in underserved communities as possible. And um, it would be about an over four hundred million dollar increase. Um, and uh, that is, uh, you know, I think the, the last slide has my contact info. Um, and that is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, there, there's obviously much more we do, but that really, when it comes to uh, funding priorities, that is our, our um, portfolio for the year. And uh, again, want to thank everybody and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Jay, for being with us and walking us through that. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Um, the first is, how are conditions or diagnostics prioritized in newborn screenings? So I think, um, I know that uh, Dylan Simon is, is on, and I know he's actually, I believe he follows me after this, but uh, perhaps he can um, ag address the more clinical, because it seems like... Um, uh, a more of a clinical uh, question that I think Dylan's better suited to answer. Uh, yeah, so happy to jump in here. Uh, so prioritization is not the word I would, I would use when talking about how uh, states decide which conditions to screen for. Uh, it's looking more at the science and the evidence behind uh, various conditions. Uh, and what they're looking at specifically is, uh, not specific, actually what they're looking at broadly is are you able to test uh, for the condition in a, in a broad population? Uh, do you have a treatment or care standard um, for the condition? And can you, are you able to show that there's a benefit to early asymptomatic treatment? So those are kind of the three broad areas that they look at. Um, obviously, happy to follow up more if you have any additional questions because we can go into a lot more detail, but those are kind of the broad areas that they're looking at. Great, thank you. Um, and another question for Jay, um, what type of technical assistance is being used for the maternal mental health and substance abuse initiative? So uh, what what the, the assistance provided um, for the maternal mental uh, health hotline, it's mostly done through counselors, obviously qualified counselors that provide a lot of, um, you know, they're available 24 hours a day. Uh, they're available by phone, they're available by text. Um, and they really provide, uh, there's there's a whole diverse um, 
background, for, especially for resources, um, so, you know, specific to um, uh, maternal health uh, condition that uh, someone could be experiencing, uh, provides a lot of family related support, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is actually modeled, it is somewhat modeled um, after the suicide prevention hotline. And, um, you know, it is, uh, you know, it is um, a very, very highly advertised service. Um, so for the hotline, it's mostly, uh, it, you know, kind of modeled after the suicide prevention hotline, but then providing specifically uh, trained counselors to address uh, maternal mental health and the assistance um, with regards to the substance abuse um, or substance disorder grant. Again, it's it's grants to states. It is very small at this time, but again, it is um, kind of somewhat similar. It is to provide kind of community-based um, educational materials in combating substance abuse. It provides uh, professional, you know, trained professionals, or, or it helps. Uh, you know, you, grant funds can help to, to invest in more trained professionals, but primarily in educational, um, you know, educational needs, um, and uh, that can be available in a lot of community-based uh, organizations. Got it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. We really appreciate mm -hmm. you being here and answering all of our questions. Again, thanks for having me. Absolutely, of course. And next we have Dylan Simon with the Every Life Foundation. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers thus far who have spoken uh, about such important issues that impact the rare disease community. And I, I think it was important to know when we're talking about the Every Life Foundation's appropriations requests, uh, the three I'll talk through today are the ones that we're specifically putting into offices, but we support a lot, of, a lot of other ones. Um, I know we've worked a lot with Jay um, on the newborn screening uh, appropriations request, and so just wanted to flag that at, at the top. Um, but today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the three specific requests uh, that we're looking at uh, from the Everlife Foundation. And the the idea behind all of these is to really look at how can we continue to support uh, funding for both rare disease therapy development, rare disease research, and looking at ultra rare, and, and how can we continue to to grow within the rare disease space. Uh, and so first, um, we're looking at rare disease therapy development. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, so there's actually a summary slide, so I'll start here. Uh, so you can see all three um, of what we're looking at, which is how can we look at the also orphan product development, which is where a lot of great work is done. Uh, and specifically within the orphan product development, they have a products grant program. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about that and, and ways that we continue to support uh, funding for that program. Uh, in addition, looking at broad increase uh, in funding to NCATS, uh, which is really the heart of a lot of rare disease research at, at the NIH. Uh, and lastly, a com commissioning a study on how to, what is needed to define ultra rare diseases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first uh, is rare disease research at the FDA. And so the FDA has this really great program known as the Orphan Products Grant Program. So that sits within the Office uh, of Orphan Product Development. Uh, and what this does is it has two really unique Grant programs. One is the Orphan Products Grant Program, or one is the apologies, the Orphan Product Clinical Trials Grant Program, as well as one is the Natural History Grants Program. Uh, and these two programs provide unique opportunities to add increase funding, increase the amount of uh, dollars out there to help support rare disease therapy development, whether it's through supporting clinical trials um, or natural history studies, which can be so important in, in better understanding conditions as well as potentially acting as. Uh, part of clinical trials. And, and we saw that recently in a free taxi approval FDA, where the FDA utilized a natural history study that was actually funded through this grants program to help uh, lead to the approval of a new, to the first ever treatment within the free taxi space. And so we know that this, that these grant programs have a really unique ability to provide funding at potential gaps within the rare disease ther therapy development space uh, and ensure the fact that we can get more uh, rare disease therapy approvals uh, in the coming years. And so what we're asking for uh, is to provide $30 million uh, to the grants program specifically, uh, which reflects its fully authorized funding level, uh, which was just recently reauthorized uh, in the FY23 omnibus. Uh, and so we know that that is the number. So we're, we're just requesting for fully funding uh, at that number, as well as supporting the below report language to really highlight the importance uh, of the work at, uh, within that grant program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so the next is looking at rare disease research at NCATS. Uh, and so at NCATS, there is a division of rare disease research innovation. And the reason I want to flag that is because it really highlights the fact that NCATS is the, 
the hub a lot of a lot of rare disease research that occurs with, within the NIH. Uh, and so you, you'll get a lot of fantastic research occurring at the different institutes within NIH that looks at specific diseases. Uh, and that all goes based on what, what the condition is and where it fits within the institutes. Uh, however, NCATS has a unique ability uh, to bring all that together. So NCATS has a lot of great work around how can we look at rare diseases as a whole, uh, whether it's through their paid GT program, um, or uh, other programs that look at how can we leverage the rare disease community as a whole and rare disease research as a whole. And so looking at ways to create platform technology to ensure the fact that you are developing resources that can benefit multiple conditions uh, simultaneously. Uh, and so we want to advocate for a 5% increase in funding, which is where you get the 969 uh, million uh, for the NCATS, uh, an increase in funding to support that work. And so that 5%, is in line uh, with the typical community ask around increase to NIH funding. Uh, and so that's, we want, just want to ensure the fact that NCATS is receiving a similar uh, in investment as the rest of NIH. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and last, I want to talk a little bit about ultra rare diseases. Uh, and so as many of you are aware on this call, uh, we have seen a lot of great progress uh, within the rare disease therapy development uh, since the Orphan Drug Act passed 40 years ago. However, we also know that within that space, we there are still unique challenges to very small populations or the ultra-rare disease communities. Uh, and so what we want to do is start having the conversation of what are incentives that are, are needed to help um, to help incent better incentivize rare disease therapy development for these small populations. Uh, and so we know to do that, we need to really kind of start at the beginning uh, and really have a definition of what is an ultra-rare disease. Uh, and so here you can see within the language, uh, it, would in, it would ask uh, for $1.5 million in funding to support a National Academy of Sciences to produce a report uh, on what is the ideal process to determine a definition for ultra-rare diseases. Uh, and you can see here, we're going to very specific questions because what we want to ensure is the fact that we're not asking the National Academy to provide a specific de definition. What we want them to do is to really look at the whole process and see what are the costs and benefits of providing the definition? And if the costs do outweigh the benefits, what is the appropriate way that we should be moving forward on how to define ultra rare? Who are the stakeholders we need? What are the questions we need answering? Because once we have that report, we can, we can start moving forward and say, okay, this is what we need to do to properly define ultra rare so that we can start developing better incentives uh, so that we, for the ultra rare therapy development. Uh, and so that's where, where we are is specifically this report language, which really goes into depth uh, of how best to define, how best to talk about that, that definition process. Uh, and so I know many of you saw this at Rare Disease Week a few weeks ago, and so there is the one pager available, um, but happy to answer any questions as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Dylan. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions just yet, but definitely keep an eye out uh, on the chat and Q&A. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to John. Uh, John is joining us from the American Association for Cancer Research. Uh, so thank you for being here, John. I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Caitlin. And uh, I think it'd be helpful just to provide a little bit of background. My name is John Retzloff. I'm the Chief Policy Officer for AACR. So we have an office of 12 in D.C. and, and, and 250 people in, in um, Philadelphia, representing 54,000 uh, cancer researchers across the world, really, two-thirds of them in the U.S. and everything. So why don't we, uh, next slide, we'll just kind of give you an idea, some background. Um, in terms of you know what we advocate for, uh, first and foremost, it's really to sustain robust funding increases for NIH and NCI, uh, because so much, so many of our members are reliant on that funding. Uh, we collaborate with the FDA on, on many issues. In fact, next uh, three weeks from now, we have our annual meeting in Orlando. We have a whole regulatory science and policy track. Forty FDA employees will be there on, on, on many, many issues that are important to our entire community and everything. Uh, and then we work very closely. You know. The, it was said many times on this call in terms of the different pieces of legislation, the appropriations language and things like that. So we're, we're constantly in, in congressional offices talking about that and working with the entire community. So really the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases is a very close partner on, on many ways. So next slide. 
Oh, you know, we have a um, we have a science policy government affairs committee uh, that that provides us with the insight advice on on, on, on ways to move forward. Uh, next slide. We also have three subcommittees that, that focus on everything from tobacco products and cancer, health policy related issues and regulatory science and policy. Uh, next slide. It was it talked about earlier the cancer moonshot uh, 2.0. This is the the reignited cancer moonshot um, that that began when uh, President Biden was vice president under President Obama, and uh, th this is something that is extremely important to us. We are um, constantly advocating for more funding there, but also a balance. You know, one thing. Uh, that the president has proposed through the reignited cancer moonshot was the uh, the ARPA-H, which is the agency for uh, for a healthy kind of uh, like DARPA within the Defense Department, some uh, new ways to do things. And, and they've been putting a lot of billions of dollars into that. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the foundation for NIH and NCI is very much supported going forward. So next slide. This just shows a little bit about the, the focus of the, the cancer moonshot in terms of uh, diagnosing cancer earlier. So preventing early screening for cancer, addressing the inequities that exist today and, and targeting the right treatments. So you can see the, the rest of them. So next slide, just in the interest of time, we'll kind of move along here. So. Uh, and, and one thing, Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases have been, has been a great partner, supporter, uh, provided financial support for the Rally for Medical Research Hill Day, which we just had our 10th annual in D.C. in September. We've been doing this for 10 straight years. 400 organizations are partnering on this, and uh, it's all about overall NIH funding. So it's, it's to all with the, we need to raise all the boats for all the 27 different institutes and centers of the NIH, enabling all of them to be doing uh, good, important research, and we get people from all over the country to participate in this um, important initiative. We also have uh, Hill Days. Uh, we just had an early career Hill Day uh, in D.C., so we have some AACR-focused uh, Hill Days that are uh, all about inspiring support for NIH and NCI funding on Capitol Hill. Next slide. And, and this was the reception that we held before. We always have members of Congress speak to the entire uh, group that's in for the Rally for Medical Research Hill Day, including NIH uh, leadership. So Francis Collins, who was just stepping uh, down from the directorship of NIH, and he had been to the rally 10 straight years at this reception, as well as uh, Dr. Tabak, who's, who's uh, serving the duties of the NIH director at this time. Next slide. In terms of uh, one of the other important issues is, is our every year we've been putting forward a cancer progress report to, to inspire support uh, on Capitol Hill for uh, more money for cancer research and everything. It was talked about earlier, most types of cancer are considered rare. So we that's where we really align with the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's there are so many rare diseases that really need uh, individual attention and support for. So this is a report that comes out every year. Next slide. And and we had an NCI director. The first uh, female NCI director was announced uh, late 2022. Uh, we work very closely, as it was talked on the call, how every, every one of us from the community is constantly working with not only Capitol Hill, but working with the agency officials, the agency leaders. It's so important for us to achieve our goals that we have uh, set out to do. Next slide. And these are just some of the other issues that, that we are uh, constantly looking at in terms of uh, trying to get rid of uh, flavorings and e-cigarettes, uh, e cigarettes especially with the um, increase in use by young adults and everything. So that's, that's, that's one of our priorities, as well as the next slide is uh, the disparities progress report. We, we uh, submitted the second one last year, presented the second one. Uh, it, it's so important on Capitol Hill now in terms of the inequities issues and uh, disparities that we have been trying to um, eliminate in many ways. And, and, and these reports showcase some of the ways that we can do that. So I think that's uh, next slide coming up on the end, I believe. So thanks, Caitlin, for pushing. And I guess in that last few slides are just how we work really with the community and the advocates, which are so important. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, we have a scientist survivor advocate program at the annual meeting. 40 advocates come in, they learn all about science, and they go back into their communities and they can advocate even on a, uh, a higher level and uh, a more informed level. Next slide. 
and we we have virtual such as we're on right now a virtual forum which is very good for sharing information and providing uh providing information for you all to to do your respective jobs and everything we try to do that as well at the acr through these patient advocate forums on on these topics here so i think that's pretty much the uh it and thank you very much for the opportunity again great thank you so much john um i'm not seeing any questions in the q a in chat um but thank you for joining us and thank you to all of our speakers for joining us and sharing your organization's uh, rare disease appropriation priorities um our next rda webinar is going to be on april 20th um, if you are interested in hearing about certain topics during our RDLA webinars, or if you yourself are interested in presenting on behalf of your organization, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is here on the screen. And then, of course, if you are not already signed up for our newsletter, um, please go to our website, rareadvocates.org, and get signed up. This is the best way to stay up to date with everything that we're doing um, and what's going on within the rare disease community. We also have action alerts that you can fill out um, that will go straight to your members. They are topic-based, so feel free to check those out. And then, of course, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with what is going on within the Every Life Foundation and within RDLA. And last but not least, a thank you to our March RDLA webinar sponsors, Horizon and Santa Fe. And thank you guys all for joining us today. We really appreciate you and appreciate all the speakers for taking their time uh, again to come share about their organization's priorities. So thank you guys. We will see you all in April.